suddenly he feels, I don't have to be afraid anymore. I'm just going to be my true self. I'm just going to follow my instinct. And then I'm invincible. All right, welcome everybody to this new video. Last time I was talking about Hermann Hesse, Der Steppenwolf, and I was pointing out Hermann Hesse's biography. So it's about like the author and how the author incorporates his private life, his personal life into the novel and how he tries to overcome certain problems of his life in his literature. So today I want to talk about Steppenwolf, the novel's structure, and I'm going to point out what the characters mean, how they interact, and how Harihara, the protagonist, is introduced by Hesse. So first of all, last time I stopped at 1927. 1927 is a very significant year in German history because, for one thing, it marks a decisive turning point in the Weimar Republic. It was the time when everything was kind of like flourishing, the arts were flourishing, people were finding like a new raison d'etre, a new meaning of life, a new reason to live, but at the same time, they were also trying to forget everything about the First World War, about their economic crisis, about the uncertainty of the time, and about death itself. And so Hermann Hesse, he also published Der Steppenwolf in 1927. And so he incorporates all the uh, crises, contemporary crises, in his novel. And he also mixes them up with personal crises. And in the same year, 1927, Heidegger published Being and Time, Side on Side. And it will be very interesting to point out how like Hesse and Heidegger made the same observations about that year and this era that ultimately led to National Socialism. All right. They didn't know this at that time, but it was kind of, it was in the air. So something was just off. And after that, I mean, like economic decline, everything, that's basically what led to the rise of Hitler. So the golden 20s, they were approaching their end. Now the structure of the novel is pretty interesting. So in the beginning, we start with the preface of the editor. And the second chapter is Harry Haller's notes. The third chapter is very, very important. And I will make a separate video about it because it's the treatise on the Steppenwolf. The fourth chapter continues Harihara's notes, and in the fifth chapter, his notes will lead to the encounter with Helmina. Who Helmina is, I will point out in a minute, and she's extremely significant for the whole story. In the sixth chapter, Harihara meets Maria and Pablo. Now, Maria is someone Helmina introduces to Harihara, and Pablo is a very interesting character because he's a jazz musician. Um, Harihara hates jazz. He likes classical music, which he considers the peak of art. And jazz, to his mind, is something inferior. The last chapter is about the magic of theater, das magische Theater. And that theater is not really a real place. It's more like a place that exists underneath the surface of the city. And um, basically, in order to go there, you have to descend into your own abyss. And um, it's more like um, it's a process of introspection that can lead you to the magic of theater where you basically confront yourself. So the whole book, like the Steppenwolf, is more or less like a soul biography. Hesse comes from the Romantic tradition. Of course, the Romantic tradition also comes from a different tradition. And um, what you have to know about uh, German literature is like the really significant developments in German literature started basically with Goethe. We had novels before that, that's right, okay, no problem. But it all emerged out of the Christian tradition of diary writing. So basically what happened was that, so there were many literary works that basically picked up that soul diary, soul biography thing. And um, Hesse, he picks that up too. Basically, it's a confession. And uh, if you look at like European literature, um, you'll see like, uh, you know, St. Augustine, his confessions are, of course, a very important text. But then, of course, like uh, Rousseau's confessions are also a milestone in literature. And Steppenwolf is also a soul diary. It's a confession of sorts because Hesse confronts his own shortcomings, and he confronts his own fears. So it fits right into this tradition of soul diaries, soul biographies, and the Christian tradition of introspection. So basically what they had to do is like uh, after Martin Luther started the Reformation, um, the whole relationship between man and God 
changed. In Catholicism, you needed a mediator. So it's like when you wanted to speak to God, there was a priest. And he was like the guy in between you and God. And he could pass on your information to God and God's information to you. Now, Luther changed that. Basically, what happened is he put God in your soul. So this means now you have a direct connection to God. So the opportunity to communicate with God, that's like the freedom a Christian has in Luther's mind. The problem is, will he answer you? <laughs> will he listen to what you said? Well, you don't know. So this is the big, big, big question. Does God listen to me? Does he hear what I say? And um, in the end, there's always uncertainty about that thing. So it's not like uh, buying indulgences and then you can just pay your way into heaven. No, because how could you influence God's decision about your life? Well, you're not in that place. It's not your place to do that. So in a way, you will always have uncertainty. The only thing you can do is like observe your own shortcomings. Observe how you behave in society. Are you a good person? Are you living up to what God wants from you? So these things you always have to consider. And then a good way to do this is keep a diary because you can write everything you have done in a day down and then you can reread it and see what aspect was not ideal. What do I have to change about myself, my own conduct? How do I interact with other people? Am I a good influence in society? So it's always like these things that you have to consider to improve yourself. So it's about self-improvement. And now Hesse, he just picks up on that tradition for the Steppenwolf. So basically, Harry Haller's notes, they are confessions and they are self-observations. The one author who perfected this was Goethe. And he came out of this Christian tradition of diary writing. And so he was basically the first one who really, really successfully employed that method as a writer. And that was basically when German literature itself was born. So it came out of this tradition of self-criticism, self-observation, self-doubts, and the will to improve one's flaws. So in Hesse Steppenwolf, there's two crises the author wants to address. First of all, is the personal crisis. So the personal crisis, of course, first of all, is like midlife crisis. I mean, Harry Hala is about 50 years old, and he already has a long history of personal struggles and so on. So he has a lot of baggage that he is carrying around with him. And then the second crisis is contemporary crisis. So the state of the world, the state of society. And the problem is like personal crisis and contemporary crisis, they are kind of like linked. But your personal crisis will most likely not influence society. But that contemporary crises like political crises, economic crises, wars, whatever, they will have an impact on your personal life and might feed your crisis. So Hesse kind of combines these two spheres and has a protagonist face his own personal crisis while at the same time worrying about contemporary global crises. So what I want to do now is read a paragraph from Steppenwolf and here Hesse explains the situation of Harry Hala. I actually wanted to split it up into sections. I promise it's only one sentence. So I'm just going to read it and then give you the translation. Wer die anderen Tage geschmeckt hat, die Bösen, die mit den Gichtanfällen oder die mit ihrem Schlimmen hinter den Augäpfeln festgewurzelten, teufelschiede Tätigkeit von Auge und Ohr, aus einer Freude zur Qual verhexten Kopfweh oder jene Tage des Seelensterbens, jene argen Tage der inneren Leere und Verzweiflung, an denen uns inmitten der zerstörten und von Aktiengesellschaften ausgesogenen Erde die Menschenwelt und sogenannte Kultur in ihrem verlogenen und gemeinblechernen Jahrmarktsglanz auf Schritt und Tritt wie ein Brechmittel entgegengrenzt, konzentriert und zum Gipfel der Unleidlichkeit getrieben im eigenen kranken Ich. Wer jene Höllentage geschmeckt hat, der ist mit solchen Normal- und Halb- und Halbtagen gleich dem heutigen sehr zufrieden. Dankbar sitzt er am warmen Ofen, dankbar stellt er beim Lesen des Morgenblattes fest, dass auch heute wieder kein Krieg ausgebrochen, keine neue Diktatur errichtet, keine besonders krasse Schweinerei in Politik und Wirtschaft aufgedeckt worden ist. Dankbar stimmt er die Seiten seiner verrosteten Leier zu einem gemäßigten, einem leidlich frohen, einem nahezu vergnügten Dankpsalm mit dem er seinen stillen, sanften, etwas mit Brom betäubten Zufriedenheits halb und halb Gott langweilt. Und in der lautigen Luft dieser zufriedenen Langeweile, dieser sehr dankenswerten Schmerzlosigkeit sehen die beiden, 
der öde nickende Halb- und Halbgott und der leicht angegraute, den gedämpften Psalm singende Halb- und Halbmensch einander wie Zwillinge ähnlich. What Hesse does here is, he confronts the boring days of human existence, the days where nothing bad happens, like you just sit in front of an oven and you don't do anything, probably have some alcohol, probably do some drugs to relax you. But these uneventful days are a lot better than the bösen mit Gichtanfällen, than the evil days, the days full of gout, the days full of eye pain, headache. And the days when your soul dies, Seelen sterben. So the days when you are empty inside, you feel the void and you feel this deep, deep, deep frustration when your soul dies. So it's like the day when you feel that the big companies are like parasites and they suck out the earth's resources. When the human world is just fake, it's phony. Everything is like something that makes you vomit and you can't take it anymore. So if there's a boring day, you have to be happy with it because you can say you read the paper and you realize there is no new war and there's no new dictator. So there's no political scandal, no economic scandal. So you just can take your old guitar. The strings might even be rusty. It doesn't matter. And you can just sing a nice tune to it. And you can sing, and you can just sing a nice tune, and you just can sing a nice song. And if you're sedated enough, maybe, and if you're sedated enough, and you might sedate yourself with something, and you can breathe this warm and boring air. And the boredom you feel is very pleasant because you don't feel any pain. And the boring, nodding half and half God and the gray half and half human, they will look at each other and look like twins. And he continues, wie sollte ich nicht ein Steppenwolf von ruppiger Eremit sein mitten einer Welt, von deren Zielen ich keines teile, von deren Freuden keine zu mir spricht? So how could I not become a Steppenwolf, a hermit, in this world whose goals I do not share, I do not care about and whose pleasures just make me numb? Und in der Tat, wenn die Welt recht hat, wenn diese Musik in den Cafés, diese Massenvergnügungen, diese amerikanischen, mit so wenigen zufriedenen Menschen recht haben, dann habe ich Unrecht. Dann bin ich verrückt. Dann bin ich wirklich der Steppenwolf, den ich mich oft nannte. Das in eine ihm fremde und unverständliche Welt verirrte Tier, das seine Heimat, Luft und Nahrung nicht mehr findet. And he says, well, if this world is actually right, if the music in the cafés, those mass events, those American people who can be happy with so little, if they are right, then I am wrong, then I am crazy, then I really am the Steppenwolf. I am that animal that lost its way in this foreign world that it can't understand, and it doesn't find its home, the air to breathe, and the food to eat. So this kind of summarizes his feeling of being lost in this world. He has no place. He can't even breathe. Can't even find anything that's worth eating. So this is Harry Hala. Now, in the beginning, in the preface, uh, Harry Hala is introduced, and he's quite an unusual person. So he is very talented, he is middle-aged, probably around 50, and um, he moves into a room in a city, or in a town, we don't really know. This town might be Basel, Basel, Switzerland, and uh, Hesse, he used to live there, so he knows the topography of the city. Anyway, so Nagy Hala, he's uh, very educated, he is very civilized, but he's lone and he's being depicted as a Steppenwolf. And we don't really know anything about his background, so it kind of like, so Hesse does not specify it. Now then Hesse moves to Harry Hala's notes, and those notes are titled Nur für Verrückte, only for crazy people. So Harry Hala, he's, so he's tired of life. And he detests the bourgeois world. He himself is part of the bourgeois world because he's an artist and he appreciates the achievements of society, especially, especially music and literature. So above all, he loves classical music. He worships Mozart and he also worships Goethe. So classical music is the best, but he hates jazz. Jazz to him is, nah, it's just like a, a lower kind of music. It's very significant because he will have to learn how to appreciate jazz. So Harry Hala, he goes out and he wants to eat something, so he finds a restaurant. In front of this restaurant, there's like a guy, he's wearing like worker's clothes and he's selling a book. This book is the treatise on the Steppenwolf and Hala buys a copy. In the treatise, human nature and are compared. Most importantly, it's about 
being tired of civilization. It's civilization fatigue versus animalistic vitalism, energy. So you have civilization as something that doesn't keep you going, but your urges, your animalistic drives, they make you feel energy. They make you feel alive. And this is what Harihala also represents. Anyway, so Harihala, he again has doubts about the authenticity of culture. He feels inauthentic. It's just phony. It's just something that is not true to itself. So Harihala, he takes this book home and after reading it, he writes his poem. I introduced that poem last time. It's about not having a home running around in a winter landscape and uh, trying to find something to eat. And Harihala writes this poem and then he falls asleep. And the next day, basically what happens, he goes to like a party. He goes to a party. It's like a professor who is the host of the party. Now the professor himself, he represents this bourgeois world because he's a very accomplished member of that society. And what happens is he and Harihala, they get into an argument. And Harihala, he tells this professor off and he wins the argument. But how does he win? Because he doesn't care anymore about the rules of society. He becomes a wolf and he's very direct and he just follows his instinct and doesn't really think about what he's saying. So this marks the victory of the wolf and he wins against the bourgeois society, against the ordered normal world. And this gives Harihala a feeling of power. Suddenly he feels, I don't have to be afraid anymore. So what? I'm just going to be my true self. I'm just going to follow my instinct. And then I'm invincible. In the next chapter, Harihala goes to a restaurant. It's called Schwarzer Adler, uh, the Black Eagle, pretty cool name. And in that Black Eagle, well, actually it's a brothel. So he eats there and he meets a young woman who's called Hermine. Hermine is like a waitress and she also offers other services. And Harihala is impressed with her because she does not respect him. Harihala himself is a middle-aged man. He wears a suit, so he's very respectable. He is well-mannered and you can tell right away that this man is educated and financially well-off. And he's a member of like the upper class of the society. And Hala is impressed. He says, oh, no one has ever treated me like that. So she's direct. She just says whatever she wants to say. She's not afraid. She doesn't respect me. And why would she? Because I'm just a guy. So he is fascinated by Hermina's vitality, by her energy. And they get to talk and Hermina says, well, if you want to understand me, you have to learn to dance. And Hariyala said, well, I, I don't really dance. I said, oh, you have to start. The problem is she wants him to learn jazz. Hariyala hates jazz. And she says, well, I'm going to teach you how to dance, but we will dance to jazz music. And you will pay me because I'm your teacher. And you will also buy all the equipment, the record player, the records and everything else. And Harihala agrees. So they get to know each other better. And Hermina says something very, very important. She says, at some point, you will kill me. Harihala says, what, what do you mean? It's like, well, you will kill me. He says, this can't be. I'm not a killer. I'm not that kind of violent person. It's like... Well, you will kill me. It's very significant. So Hermine lives in this unofficial world. It's a world that exists under the visible, the official world. And then she introduces Pablo to Hala. And Pablo is very skilled when it comes to the use of drugs. And this is very important because Harry Hala has to learn how to let loose. So his resistance against losing control is very important. And Harry Hala realizes, probably I can't be happy when I'm chasing after a good life, a comfortable life, a life in certainty. So he comes to the conclusion, the only thing that I can do is like Glück suchen im Tod. I'm going to find my serenity in death. Now this leads back to Heidegger, who says, if you do not realize that you will die, if you don't incorporate death in your life, then you can't live. So the sphere of death 
is a vital part to life. And so Hala realizes, so real happiness can only be achieved when you realize that you're going to lose it all at one point. That makes it precious because it's not going to be there forever. It's not eternity. There cannot be bliss. There cannot be serenity for eternity. The last chapter takes Harihala to the Magical Theater. Now, the Magical Theater is not really a real place. So, so he attends a ball. So everyone has to wear costumes and masks. So people don't know who the others are. And Harihala, he goes there and he's looking for Hermina, but he can't find her. So he gets kind of desperate. And then he just descends into the Magical Theater. The Magical Theater is kind of like a maze that exists under the city. And while he goes in there, he gets deeper and deeper under the ground. And what it means is basically he is descending into his own abyss, into his own soul. Because he's looking for something. Well, what, was he, what is he looking for? Well, he's looking for himself, of course. And he's also looking for his shadow. It's going to be very important. And I am going to talk about this in more detail later on. So the whole scene is like a hallucination. Because he's also on drugs. So he's descending into the maze of his own psyche. And in the end, it's an initiation process. So he dies. But then he's resurrected again. And by his death and resurrection, he is able to overcome his crisis. But first of all, he has to kill one very, very significant enemy. And it's not going to be Hamina. And who he's going to kill, I will point out in a later video. So next time, I'm going to talk about the treatise on the Steppenwolf. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time.